Hello everyone, my name is Michael and today we're going to take a look at some ransomware. Now today's sample is a ransomware that goes by the name Globe Imposter. I believe this is a 2.0 sample actually. Um, and one thing I wanted to analyze with this one is actually its configuration. Uh, because instead of like regular uh, other samples that we've overviewed in this channel, um, it actually encrypts its configuration. So the ransom note, the uh, like the address to pay, uh, the extension it's going to use is actually in an encrypted payload. Um, so if we uh, take a look at it in PE Studio, uh, as usual for just a quick static analysis, we'll kind of take a look through the strings and we'll see um, if we scroll here, we'll actually not see the ransom note. Um, we'll see this very interesting long ASCII hex string. But other than that, there's nothing with a ransom note or anything else to really discern from this. Um, however, if we take a look at the resources, we can see there's two codatas. Uh, there's a 104 and a 105. If we scroll over, we can get a preview of the hex. And we can see there's a little bit of some matching characters. Every other character is the same uh, the same hex. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, let's go ahead and dump these to the desktop. Let's call it codata. This one's 104.bin. <clears throat> this one, 105.bin. So we can take a look at these in the hex editor. And once again, if we kind of, I kind of flip through these real quick so that my eye can see there's some bytes that are staying the same. And it kind of starts with the same few bytes. So this is an indication just to me, uh, even kind of after knowing what's going on here, um, that it maybe is XORed with the same key or something. Um, so we'll go ahead and take a look at this in the disassembler. I'm going to use IDA freeware once again. And we'll start off at the entry point. Now, since I know it's working with some resources, I'm going to take a look at the imports. Um, there's kind of some boilerplate code for how you interact with a resource on uh, in C++. So uh, let's take a look at where this load resource is referenced. And we'll see they kind of use find a resource, load resource, size of resource, lock resource. Uh, this is all pretty standard. You can find a Stack Overflow example of this exact code, uh, which is what I used for referencing this myself. And basically, you kind of get the the resource, and then you find out how big it is so that you can allocate it into your own byte array. Um, so we'll see. I actually named this function get a resource um, just so I can see where it's called from. So we'll go ahead and uh, see its references, and we'll see here it's called twice in this function here. And we're going to call it with the 104 and the 105. So this must be where uh, we're going to get the resource and do something with it. Um, I also notice that there's a function right after that. We push some arguments, including EAX. EAX is the return of this get a resource function and some other string here. We're passing it in both instances to this other function. Uh, so this to me maybe is some type of decryption or something. So what I'd like to do is take this into, we're going to go ahead and jump into a debugger. Uh, once again the debugger I use is x64 dbg or x32 dbg uh, for 32-bit. So I've already set a breakpoint at that same location we were at. Uh, this is our call, uh, get a resource function. And I'm going to go ahead and hit run once, and we'll see our pointers right here. So, all right, we're going to we're gonna step over that, and we're going to take a look at EAX in the dump. Now we see this is our resource. It should be the 104 resource, since that's the first one we call. And if we take a quick look, 1A943D DDF blah blah blah. Uh, yep, looks like we we got our resource. So let's go ahead and step over, step over. Now we see we just pushed onto the stack to push as an argument for this next function that I'm suspecting does something. Um, a part of that string that we had looked at earlier. Uh, let's go ahead and back in IDA. Let's take a look at the strings view. 
we can see this uh, very long hexadecimal looking ASCII characters in the strings. So I wonder if that's some type of a key. Let's uh, prepare another dump here. We just uh, we're sitting at this call, which matches up with this suspected uh, function here. Let's go ahead and step over it. And now let's take a look at its return, which is EAX. And OK, here we go. We have a decrypted ransom note in HTML. So all right. So our next step then is to figure out what this function did to take this garbage and turn it into an HTML. And this is actually UTF-16 encoding, which is why there's a uh, it's like a wide character. Uh, there's zeros after each one of these characters. Um, and then this is a new line and such. So let's go ahead and take a look back at Ida. See if we can figure out what this is. Let's go ahead and name our function decrypt resource. And let's drill into it. So we know that we're passing it two arguments. We have a string and then probably the integer is actually probably parse strong. It's probably the, the byte array of the resource. Uh, so let's take a look here. We're allocating some stuff. We're getting the string length. And we call a function here with string length and probably our key. And then just kind of overview, taking a look further here, we have a for loop here, uh, as indicated by the thick arrow. Doesn't necessarily mean for, it could be a while loop. But um, we're going to call a function, take its output, XOR it with something else, which I believe if we look up further, this is part of one of those arguments. So. We're XORing the output of this function with part of the input string. Then we're incrementing the counter and continue looping. So this general concept to me, just from experience, kind of makes me suspect it's a stream cipher. That being, um, we this may be the setup with the key. And then we call a function to, to derive something from the key um, and then we XOR it, and this basically is the, how a stream cipher works. So uh, let's take a look at this first function, and we'll see the first part it does here. Uh, it looks like this for loop goes from goes through the numbers zero to 255, and just keeps pushing them into a buffer here. So that seems like it's initializing an array with 0 through 255. And then we come down here and we have another for loop with a bunch of math going on here. Now, I've already actually identified this in the past um, from my notes. I see that I, rec that I actually derived this as the RC4 algorithm. And we'll go ahead and uh, kind of confirm that by going to... Uh, let's go back to yep our first function here, and let's pull up the RC4 uh, algorithm Wikipedia here, and it talks about how it's a stream cipher. It's, there's some attacks against it and such that we can't take advantage of here, but um, so basically it generates a pseudo random stream of bits or a key stream, and then you basically just take that and XOR it with your your uh, plain text to become your ciphertext. So we'll take a look at this key scheduling algorithm, which is going to be what our first function whoops, back here is. So we have to take the key. Sorry, it keeps flipping to the wrong window. <laughs> we take our key that we're given, and we do something with it to kind of occupy some buffers to initialize our algorithm. So we'll see here. We start by just going from 0 to 255, or to uh, 256 if you're using a less than uh, bounds and we just fill the buffer zero with zero a bunch of bytes zero through 255 and that's exactly what we're seeing right here we're looping over from zero uh, we can tell XOR EAX to EAX when you XOR a buffer by itself it becomes zero um, we go through that and we generate that so then we go, we set J to zero, and we do another loop of zero to 255. 
XOR some stuff. So one of these is going to be our J. And we're comparing with 255 at the bottom of the loop. So, or 256. So it looks very similar. And we're doing some, mo some math here with swapping some values and uh, doing some modulus operations with the key length and all that stuff. Um, I believe part of that actually, depending on the compiler's way of um, doing this, I think that actually is this step where it's becoming anded with uh, 0FF, if I'm correct. Uh, this would be 255. So um, I'm not super privy with the assembly here, but if you actually kind of match it up, it, it is basically this algorithm here. So as we see, we're flipping some some registers around. That's part of the swap operation using like a temp variable. Um, so we can go ahead and call this our RC4 KSA. Let's go back to our function, and then we'll see. Okay, so we generate our keys or we initialize our key stream here, and on each byte we're gonna call a function here. Uh, let's go ahead and drill into that. Uh, once again, it's uh, not super good with the assembly here, but it basically translates to this algorithm here. So while we're generating the output, uh, this is what our function is going to do since we're only calling it once per uh, per loop iteration. Uh, so yeah, we can go ahead and name this our RC4 PRGA. So, yep, so that is likely going to be RC4. So, to go ahead and just as a proof of concept, then we can go ahead and try to decrypt these resources on our own. So, let's minimize everything. I'm going to use my program called Tri Crypto Tester. Um, I made a previous video releasing this so that you can play with it yourself. And let's go ahead and take that code data 104 here. Uh, we need to grab our key. Uh, so it's actually the first characters of that. Um, let's go ahead and follow follow that in the dump here. Let's go ahead and grab it. As t okay, we already are inter interpreted it as text. I need to copy. Let's just go ahead and copy the binary so we can take a look at it in the hex editor here. So Okay, so we have 20 bytes here, or hex 14. Let's go ahead and copy that as our key. Now note that they are treating this as text. They're not loading it as actual bytes, so it's not like the hexadecimal 8D. It's, it's not parsed as 10 bytes hexadecimal. It's actually used as a string. Um, so we can go to RC4, hit decrypt and this looks familiar we have all these zero bytes that would be the the wide format so let's go ahead and save that code data 104 oops decrypted all right then let's go ahead and decrypt the 105 which is a lot shorter decrypt 105 Dash decrypted. All right, so let's take a look at these in HXD. Oops, missed. And yep, we have some HTML here. And then this one looks like it's previous. Some of these characters are a little goofed up because they're actually UTF-16 characters. I think it's like Russian characters or something. Um, but we can go ahead and uh, let's do a preview of one of these. Let's go ahead and just uh, name it with HTML. Open it up in an explorer, and yep, here's our uh, ransom note. So we can see the uh, the email address, and it calls it Morcus or whatever that is. Um, so we've successfully pulled out the ransom note from this. So. Uh, we could continue this journey and uh, look at other strings that it pulls out. The two resources in this particular sample are just the ransom note, um, but there are some other encrypted strings for further configuration. And I, in my experience, I found that the Globe Imposter samples all differ. Some of them have two resources, some have three. Um, 
some of them use a different RC4 key. They use like a hash of the R of the other string we just saw, so it's kind of weird. Um, so if you want to learn a little bit more on this particular um, like method, I actually have a Python script I released on Pastebin that actually kind of does this work for us. Um, so we can take a look uh, with the command line here. Let's go ahead and execute globe imposter xv whatever that sample was and we'll see here it pulls out that rc4 key there's that string that we used and actually that long that whole long string from earlier is actually the rsa 2048 key that it uses to encrypt its generated key for the files um, so that's a whole nother area of the ransomware there's also some other stuff here where it uh, pulled out the ransom note it found the extension that was going to be used. It found the name of the file. Um, so it decrypted some other stuff in there. And actually, if I hit, uh, if I give it the dash n flag, I can actually output the whole note, which is what we had just pulled out. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I'll put a uh, link to that on Pastebin as well. So you can kind of see how I uh, did that. It's a little bit of a mess of code because it also has to factor for, like I said, some other samples, store it in different ways. We'll see here. It uh, here's where it outputs uh, the different keys. One one variant of it uses another key for RC4 with a hash of the RSA key and all that fun stuff. So this has been a little analysis on pulling, uh, decrypting some configuration from a ransomware. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. And otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.